Okay, so to start with, we're going to talk about this idea of abstraction and conceptual stretching. Um, because, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, outcomes are very, very difficult to measure. Um, in programs, you have all sorts of different indicators um, or variables or things that you can measure. Um, you have things like inputs and activities and outputs. Um, in general, these things are directly measurable. Um, you can count the number of, of things that your program does, the number of kids that it serves, the number of waivers that it hands out, the number of citations that it mails, the number of whatever. Um, you can count these things, the number of staff you have. Um, these are generally very easy to count, and it doesn't really have a great social impact um, just counting the raw number of employees you have or the raw number of people that you have served um, with your program. What really matters and what we care about in this class is the social impact that a program has, um, specifically with the outcomes of the logic model. This is why we've been talking about program theories and theories of change, um, because we want something to change in society, something to improve, something to get better, but that something is far more abstract and it's not directly measurable. Um, generally, these things are more lofty and uh, more aspirational. Um, so if we, if we go back to that example of um, the school district um, that I did the program evaluation for years ago, um, some of the outcomes there were increased commitment to school and reduced risk factors for juvenile delinquency, um, which sound cool and lofty and, and great, but how do you measure that? Um, how do you measure commitment to school? What does that look like? How can you tell if the program has improved commitment to school? Um, you could say attendance is measuring that, um, but there are lots of people who go to school who aren't really committed. They're just going because they're going. Um, and so actual attendance records don't really pick up commitment to school. And so maybe you could instead um, have a survey and ask kids how committed to school they are on a scale of 1 to 10. Sure, but like, is that really going to capture anything? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, so these types of things are a lot harder to measure. And so that brings us to the main question for today is how do you actually measure these abstract outcomes? How do you figure out what increased commitment to school looks like? Um, and so what we're going to do to, to figure this out is um, use this concept called the ladder of abstraction. And what we want to do is build a ladder of abstraction for these, these loftier, more difficult concepts um, or these outcomes that we're trying to measure, um, and then find the right level of abstraction that feels appropriate, that feels like we're actually measuring something that is capturing um, the change that we're trying to get at, um, that reflects the change that we're hoping to, to actually cause. Um, and so for that reason, I had you watch um, this short clip from Monty Python and the Holy Grail um, about a trial for a witch. And so if you have not watched this yet, if you're watching the, the lectures before you've done the readings, which is fine, um, pause this, go to um, the first link in the uh, content for today and watch this video and then come back and we'll talk about why we're talking about Monty Python in program evaluation. So go do that really quick and then come back and I will wait. And now I'm done waiting because you should have paused me. Um, so the reason we care about this is because um, in this video, they were trying to measure something abstract. Um, they were trying to measure what constitutes a witch. Um, and they were doing it in all sorts of different ways that probably weren't great. Um, they had different criteria that they were trying to, um, to follow to, to designate um, this woman as a witch or not, um, based on her nose, based on her past history turning people into animals, um, based on whether or not she could float um, or burn, um, or other things that were wildly all over the map. Um, and it was clearly farcical here. Um, but in real life, like this, this did happen with like witch trials, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what they were essentially trying to do was figure out kind of a working definition of a witch and then apply that definition to um, this woman here. Um, and that was the point of the video is what they were trying to do. So what I want to do now is um, show you this data set of witches right here. Here's a whole bunch of different witches. 
Um, what I want you to do is pause this video in just a minute once I explain what's going to happen. Um, what I want you to do is list all of the common features of these witches in this data set and try to come up with kind of the most common criteria, the most universal criteria for what constitutes a witch based on this data set we have here. What are the most important elements? How can you tell if one of these people is a witch or not? Um, so go ahead and pause this video and write down a list of everything that you can think of that kind of defines a witch here. Um, so one, two, three, pause, and then we'll come back to me. Okay, so hopefully you did the exercise and, and listed all of the different characteristics of what makes um, these women here witches. Um, and hopefully um, one of the criteria that you listed was what I just said, that these are all women in this data set here. Um, so let's go ahead and write down some of the characteristics that we have in this data set here. Um, according to our data, um, a witch is a woman. Um, some of the witches had green faces, so green. Um, some were on broomsticks, so three of those pictures had brooms. Um, one had a cat, two had cats, or those are not cats, those are crows. So some like pet um, animal of sorts. Um, some were flying, doing magic. Um, some of them, you, historically, some have said they're like super ugly and scary, but in the case of like Sabrina and um, the witch down in this corner here, um, they're not necessarily like scary pointy hat wearers, but um, we could count that as um, some wear pointy hats and some look scary and, and shriveled and wrinkled up and some um, have houses fall on them. I don't know. Um, you can think of all sorts of different things in a list of what constitutes a witch. So if we go back to our list, why this is important is we want to figure out um, which of these characteristics here apply to kind of everybody, um, which are more universal, and which things don't fit certain cases. For instance, green here, we said that that's one of these characteristics, but not all of the women in here are green. Only two of them were. Um, the scary Halloween decoration and Elphaba from um, The Wizard of Oz. Those are the only green people, so we can probably cross that out. Um, brooms, only three of those have brooms. Um, some pet animal, only a couple of them have that. Flying, only a few are flying. So really it looks like just magic women is our kind of more general characteristic here. Um, so maybe that is our official definition of a witch. Is it there's a woman who does magic. Um, so that seems potentially too broad though. Um, because if we go and expand our data set to look something like this. Let's add these people to the data set. Um, this is Arwen from Lord of the Rings. She is an elf. Um, she is a woman and she has magic powers, but she's not a witch, she's an elf. Um, here we have some trolls. These are the troll toys from actual toys from the 80s and 90s or the movie. Um, I think Justin Timberlake is in that movie and Anna Kendrick. Um, this is Winky from Harry Potter. She's a house elf. Um, here's a woman who does magic. That is Athena. Um, but she's a goddess. She's not a witch. So if we take our concept of, of what constitutes a witch, we kind of agreed that kind of the most universal definition was a woman who does magic. That's going to be stretched too far once we start applying other cases here. Once we start applying that definition to um, these people here, our cool definition of a witch kind of falls apart and we can no longer say that Winky is a witch or that Athena is a witch. Um, and so we've stretched that concept too far and it, it's no longer useful. And so what we have to do, our challenge for trying to define what constitutes a witch is we need to figure out the right level of abstraction in our definition. Um, so we could be super, super broad and say a witch is just a mammal. All of these people, I'm assuming, are mammals. Um, trolls, who knows, but they look mammalian. They don't look like lizards, so we can call them mammals. Um, 
but that's going to be way too broad of a definition and it's not useful. So that we could say, we could then say that it's a mammal with magic powers or um, an enmagicked mammal, um, which picks up on um, witches like Sabrina, I guess, um, but it also is potentially too broad. It's picking up on trolls and elves and goddesses like Athena. It's picking up on gods, um, on male versions of all of these. And so that's not going to be super helpful. Um, so we can keep working down this ladder, ladder of abstraction and say it has to be a female in magic mammal, um, which is more specific because now we're not going to count like Zeus as a witch. Um, this is limiting us to just um, women who are in magic um, but then we kind of start lose like this starts falling apart again because um, these people don't feel kind of witch-like from a fantasy point of view here. Um, it's again a goddess and an elf and a troll. So we can keep working down this ladder. We can say it's a human woman who has magic powers. Um, in that case, that's probably more accurate because none of these people here are humans. So maybe that's our definition, that it's a magic human female. Sure. Um, we, can, we can keep making it more abstract um, as we work down this ladder here. Um, we could say that it has to be a young human. Um, that was the case with the Salem witch trials. Um, they targeted mostly young uh, women in different villages in New England. Um, we could say that it has to be a young student um, female um, magic human. Um, which picks up Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but also picks up uh, people like Hermione Granger from Harry Potter. Sure, that works. Um, we could also say not a young human, but maybe an old human. Um, and that picks up uh, the Wizard of Oz uh, witch. It picks up Halloween decorations and kind of the, the scary, stereotypical version of a witch that you find during Halloween. Um, so if we had to settle on one of these definitions in our ladder here, we probably don't want to go too far down because then that limits us. If we just say it's an old human female who is magic, um, that's going to, to get rid of kind of the young versions of witches here. If we just narrow our, our ladder on a student, um, that's going to get rid of Halloween decorations. That's going to get rid of um, people who are not students. Um, and so we need to figure out the appropriate place in this ladder to kind of pin our definition. We don't want it way up here, that's far too broad. We don't want it down here, that's far too narrow. Um, it's gonna have to be somewhere in here, probably at this human level, and just say it's a human woman that has magic. And that is what constitutes a witch. Um, and maybe that works. Um, and so we can tell the Monty Python people that that's what counts. But then you actually have to figure out what magic means. Um, and in real life, it doesn't exist. You also need to make sure that your definition is um, connected to reality and connected to your theory of what, con of what constitutes a witch. Because this sounds good, but it starts falling apart at this in magic point because magic doesn't exist. So how are you going to make sure that that's right? And what are the consequences if you have that wrong? And this is actually what happened with the Salem witch trials. Um, there was no connection to reality. Their theory was that um, women were influenced by the devil and were doing all sorts of bad things in villages. Um, but what actually happened in reality is that most of the accusations were targeted at successful women um, who were economically successful or who worked with medicine um, or who were more educated. And so it was essentially targeting women who posed a threat to the patriarchy and to the patriarchal order of their societies um, in New England and in Old England. Um, and so it was really, these witch trials weren't trying to locate magic people. Um, it was mostly a misogynistic tool for maintaining social order. And so once you have that as your main theory, um, your conceptual ladder is, is like leaned up against the entirely wrong building now. You're not trying to find magic women. You're trying to find women who are successful, who pose a threat to the ruling men, and then that's going to be your definition of a witch. Um, and so if you're looking kind of down the magic road, it's not going to get you there, and you're going to miss out on kind of the, the underlying social influences here like misogyny. Um, so you need to make sure that your ladder is actually leaning on the right concept, on the right outcome that you're trying to get at, um, and is not kind of off in the woods. Otherwise, you're going to be attempting to drown women who weigh the same weight as um, ducks because ducks float um, and wood floats and the whole Monty Python thing.
Um, so you need to make sure that everything is well connected to theory and then that you build this ladder of abstraction and choose a good spot in that ladder. This works for any of these different social outcomes you're looking at. So if you have a social outcome that says improvement in education, you need to figure out what that means. Um, it could just be like at the broadest level, person has education. Sure, but then you want to work down and say like, what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? And keep working down. You could get to the point where the person has graduated with a 4.0 from a four year college um, with a bachelor's degree in something, but that's gonna be way, way too specific. So you want to work back up the ladder to find the right level of abstraction for your outcome, um, which is improved education. Um, so in your assignments um, for this week, you're going to be going through the same process. You're going to try to figure out um, one of your program's outcomes is going to be some abstract thing. You need to build that ladder of abstraction, figure out the most broad definition, and then work your way down. So if you think back to this, this witch's data set, um, think of a data set of what your outcomes would look like. Think about who the program is serving, um, all of the different recipients of the program, um, all of the different clients, all of the different um, people who a nonprofit is, is assisting, um, and think about what they look like after they've gone through the program. And that's your data set. And then try to think of what it would look like if the program had been successful, what would their lives look like? What would be different? And try to build that same ladder of abstraction based on kind of this data set that you've collected of, of people in the people who have been served. It doesn't have to be an actual data set with like columns and rows in Excel or R or anything like that. It's really just kind of the universe of cases, what it would look like if somebody went through the program and was helped by it, and then figure out the ladder of abstraction. Um, so this is, this is hard, but it is essential because this is how we figure out if a program had an impact. Um, because programs are designed to cause outcomes. So a couple final definitional points here before we finish this section. Um, when we're talking about programs, we're talking about a few different things. Um, you have something called an outcome variable. This is the thing that you're actually measuring, commitment to school. Um, that's kind of the, the more abstract thing, but if you think back to like regression, um, you have a dependent variable or an outcome variable. This is the thing that happens because of all your independent variables, all of your explanatory variables. The actual program itself does something, has some sort of causal effect on an outcome. And so that's the thing you're actually measuring. Um, then you have something called outcome change. This is the change in the thing that you're measuring over time. So this is the Greek um, letter D for delta, or letter delta, it is D. Um, it's typically used to show change. Um, and so if you're trying to measure a change in outcome, this is just saying before somebody got involved in the program, they had some level of commitment to, ed or commitment to school. After the program, that commitment to school changed. And you want to measure that change um, before and after the program. The more specific thing that you want to find, though, is not necessarily just the change in outcome. You want to find what is called the program effect, which is the change in the thing that you're measuring over time that is specifically because of the program, not just change that happens naturally. You can tie it directly to your program. And this is the hardest thing to find, but this is what we're trying to find. This is the whole point of the class, is to find the effect of exact programs, not just changes in outcomes. So another way of looking at this is with this graph here. Um, this is a good way of visualizing all of the different parts of outcomes and things that we're measuring here. Um, so if you look on this y-axis, this is the, the outcome variable. Let's say it's commitment to school. Before the program, it's at some level. After the program, it's at some other level. And so that difference right there is the outcome change, the pre-program outcome level and the post-program outcome level. But you don't want to say that this is what happened because of the program. Because it is entirely possible that just over time, people are going to have increased commitment to school just because. Because they're getting older, there's a maturation effect, they're going to feel um, more committed to school just naturally. And so you can't say that your program, whatever it is, caused the entire outcome change. Your goal in this class is to find this instead. If you look here, this is the program effect, which we can draw better, not just an arrow, let's do this. That is the program effect. That's the thing we care about the most. Um, the only way to find that 
is to find this difference here between what happened with the program and what happened in the absence of the program. And then that difference right there is what is because of the program itself. So if you have some sort of intervention that makes kids more committed to school and you're, you're having them come to extra Saturday school or you're giving them extra tutoring or something, um, that's the program that's happening. What you want to do is see what happens specifically because of that program. And the only way to do that, according to this graph here, is to find this program effect, which you can only find if you can somehow measure what happens with the program and somehow measure what would happen if they weren't in the program, which is tricky because that seems to involve a time machine of sorts. You would have to measure the same student if they were in the program versus if they weren't and then measure that program effect. Um, in a couple sessions, we'll talk specifically about that um, because this is a counterfactual. This outcome without the program often doesn't exist um, unless you have a randomized controlled trial where you could have some people be in the program and some people not be in the program. That would kind of get at the program effect. But often you don't have that. Um, you don't have a control group to compare this with. And so instead you kind of have to invent what you think the outcome would be in the absence of the program. And that's really hard, and that's the focus of basically the rest of this class, is how you can find this program effect there. That's the thing we care about the most. Okay, so with all of that said, um, what your job is in your next um, assignment is to pick one of your outcomes for your program. You're going to figure out how abstract you want to make it. You're going to build kind of that ladder of abstraction, figure out kind of the broadest possible definition down to very narrow definitions, and then choose a spot in the middle that kind of picks up the most of your universe of cases. And then you need to figure out how you're actually going to measure that um, and what it would look like to have this program effect. So in your assignment, you're going to um, talk about a few different things. You're going to talk about a measurable definition of program effect, which means this area right here. What would this look like in real life? Um, then you're going to talk about how to actually get there and how you would measure that in an ideal world. If you had infinite resources, if you had a time machine, um, how would you ideally measure that program effect? Then I want you to talk about the feasible measurement. Given that you don't have infinite resources and given that you can't have a time machine, what can you do to potentially measure that program effect? And then talk about how it's connected to the real world. Does this abstract um, outcome that you've chosen, does this way of measuring that program effect actually reflect what happens in real life? What this means is if you decide that one of your outcomes is commitment to school, and you've decided that you're going to have a pre and a post survey for treatment and control groups where you ask students on a scale of one to 10 how committed to school they are. You have a treatment group, you have a control group, neat. But is that survey response before and after for treatment and control actually connected to actual commitment to school? Is that really picking up real life commitment to school or is that too narrow of a definition? Um, and so here's where you're going to talk about whether or not that actually is picking up on the outcome that you, you intend to measure. And so that's what you're going to be doing in your assignment, is working with this ladder of abstraction and trying to connect um, this idea of a program effect to reality and to your measurable definition. So good luck with that.